Go! Greetings and salutations, you lovely individuals. We are back on League on Mark here and Mark here at Team Beauties. It was a wild and wacky weekend. Marquee matchups, finals that didn't feel like finals, winter finals that felt like finals, and the future of the NA scene looks like it's in good hands. But we start over in EU. Summer finals. Yes, believe it or not, this was a finals. G2 versus XL. We'll get into the whole format and system that we're left with this finals in the regular EU LCS arena. But G2 looking clean on the rift. Excel had all the momentum in the world, but the most dominant series G2 has had maybe all year. Nobody, nobody stopped and said, oh, we got to fill up the tank for Mr. Excel and their wild ride through these playoffs. It runs out of fumes just at the finish line before G2 comes ripping and roaring, leaving flames down their line as they come across the finish line. Holy moly, what a squad, what a performance on the day. Looking at this team, you gotta be looking instantly right at the jungle at Mr. Yike, that rookie popping off, being that impact player every single game of this series. Yep, well-deserved finals MVP for him. 15, one and 45. The score line across those three games, only a single death. He had almost an 80% kill participation. And maybe the most impressive part is we've seen this guy play the two main play styles of jungle. Just in this series, you get the Rel and the Sejuani where he's going 0, 0 and 13. And then he says, let me at least have some fun. I'll play the Kha'Zix in game three. This guy can be the featured carry or can activate the rest of this team. The best rookie year maybe ever in Europe. I think it, without question has to be the best rookie year in Europe right now. And the way that things are going, think about this. You know, as you mentioned, being able to play both sides of that coin or the meta that we have seen establish itself in the jungle throughout the course of, you know, the many splits and the time that we have spent in this 2023 season and seeing how he's able to put that forth in a series like this and fully utilize it for G2. That consistency at that ultra top level that we have seen from him this split, arguably, I don't think we've seen from any other jungler around the globe. You can look at all these other major regions and you can find one one. Oh, we're popping off on some of these tanks. We're not quite carrying on these, you know, the carry junglers, all these type of things are reverse that situation. That's not been the story for Yike and G2. Every single thing is coming up with that big green check mark for the Samurai. And remember, even though G2 may be disappointed a bit at MSI, Yike was the guy internationally we were talking about was the most consistent and showing up against some of the best teams from Korea and China. So incredible year for him, start to finish. You know, Caps, there was no Lucian feeding games in this series. It was either Caps or Claps all series. Han Sama and Mickey were on another level in the bot lane. I've never seen across a series so many players survive with sub 100 health time and time again. I genuinely felt bad for Excel. I guarantee if I'm on the side of Excel, I'm breaking a mouse. I'm breaking something at that point. There's no way you can stay calm after seeing team fight after team fight, and especially in that final game, that game three, where every single time it just felt like it was one thing, one ability, one more attack connecting, and it shifts the game into your favor. It shifts that team fight. Didn't happen though. It is G2 domination. It is Hansama Mickey laying down the law in that bottom lane, picking up kills left, right, and center. And yes, you mentioned Mr. Caps. It was Caps and Claps, side orders of Claps coming through for this one as well. And we're not talking about Mr. Broken Blade in that top side against someone like Oda Wamne. It means that things were calm, cool, and collected in the top side. Broken Blade, Caps, and Hansama all picked up a quadra kill in this series. That's how spread uh, the domination was for G2. And the problem is, afterwards, you see G2 wins. And the guys, all right, high five. High fives around, some light hugs. It's the summer finals, and they don't even care. You heard Mickey afterwards saying, eh, I don't really care. I just wanted to deny Excel a trophy. But because you have these season finals afterwards, we're always worried about summer split meaning too much we've backed up too much and this split is 
basically meaningless. Excel qualified for this season finals, but now you have G2 who won two out of the three splits and still not even qualified for Worlds. I watched this finals with my parents and my dad was going, oh, uh, what's what are the games next week in the LEC? Thinking that it was just continuing on because it looked like any other weekend in the LEC with the way things were going. And we have talked about this before with this new format change that came in for the region and talking about, you know, all these positives with it. There would be some negatives. There would be some issues that need to be ironed out and tweaked for future years and iterations. This is absolutely one of those ones that we're looking at because the way that this final went, the way that the previous finals went, you had to look at all of them and you said it was very much deflating to see the way that the presentation was very much a similar normal type of time at the on the rift compared to where it should be to celebrate these type of moments. It's the first year of this new format, but no question there needs to be some tinkering, whether it's combining these season finals just right into the summer split so that it's just a mega extended tournament bracket or something because three straight finals just in the LCS broadcast studio is it's lame let's be honest and that's why you're seeing a dip in viewership because especially when it's a stomp like this people aren't tuning in they're waiting for these season finals tournaments so there's definitely an avenue for things to get picked up uh, or fixed up going forward but still first split first year with this new format we're giving them a chance. You can feel fantastic about G2 and EU looking so good at the top of the table until you watch the JDG series. And then you look ahead to Worlds and you say, that is one titan of a behemoth. And when Ruler is playing the most aggressive series I've ever seen out of him, it's everyone's playing for second when you see JDG it's at this level. You see JDG play like this and, you know, you're realizing and you're looking out at all these other top teams around the world and you're going, oh my goodness, look at that monster, it's huge, That's that thing is scary, they're going to be able to take down anybody. And then you realize that you see JDG and they're the ones playing with that figure as if it's like a toy or something like that. That is the scale that we're dealing with, with the power level of JDG. We have seen BLG rise them, raise themselves up all the way through this summer split in the LPL, 16 and one, only to meet the doorstopper that is JDG. They made them look like a team that squeaked into playoffs and barely qualified, but they've annihilated everybody else in the league. It feels like a combination of absolutely the mental block that BLG now has against GDG, losing to them time and time again. And simultaneously, I don't know if it's BLG is the only real threat that JDG feels because this series felt like they took it up a notch. We said they were maybe 80% in their last series. This looks like the full 100 now, and it's terrifying. It was that full dial turn for JDG, max effort, max levels of power. And you know what? I can guarantee it that we're starting to see Mr. October appear. I'm talking about Mr. Ruler down in the bottom lane, feeling it turn from the summer months into that fall time. And he understands that's the time to shine for Worlds. He was pumping up the damage, making it look clean. Nobody, and this is a great example why he's got that World Zaya skin. Nobody looking better on the Zaya right now around the world. Every one of these team fights, it felt BLG had to do so much, especially on the two Zaya games, to just pop his ulti. They finally kill him! And there's still four members of JDG alive. Knight's popping up. 369's is looking great. Kanavi has an incredible series. I don't know what's going on with this 369 Bin matchup because Bin puts everybody in the dumpster except for this matchup where you, you forget he's even on the top side. It, you know, he's this saber-tooth cat in the LPL, just taking names everywhere, taking the blood, making sure that he's getting all these kills. Powerful cat out there on the rift. And then he gets turned into a baby kitten when you go on the other side against 369, running through for this JDG team. It's incredible because as much as we talked about BLG and how good they have been, all these other things that go well for them, the Yagao angle, looking at Elk and how, how much he has developed as well, the big thing that it focuses and centers on is Bin being that Giga Bin threat in the top side. And 369, every single time asked of him on this JDG squad, shuts the door. It, it feels so 
rare to have a team that obviously mechanically is beyond world class. They're able to carry through every single lane on any given game. And then just the macro game sense that this team has too. You saw it just alone in this series. They can get a 3-4k gold lead without even getting kills. So they have like every aspect of game sense and mechanical prowess is at the highest level, which is why everyone's talking about the golden road being paved for this squad. And it's so scary because, you know, it kind of feels like almost every other year you're talking about some team rising to a level that we have never, ever seen before, that this threat that they will represent heading into Worlds is unprecedented in the history of our game. Yet JDG is ringing all of those bells. They're checking every single one off and dotting the T's on the I's. That's exactly how good and clean they have been all year. You see it put to full force against a very, very formidable squad. Got to be taking note of this one from the LPL. And of course, deservedly so. They clinched their ticket to Worlds. They're sitting in the finals. They'll play either BLG or LNG, and they will be massive favorites over whichever one of them ends up meeting them in those finals. Had another installment of the Telecom War, but it's it's a little sad to watch now. It's, it's kind of beaten up on someone who's already sick and injured, which is what KT did against T1, especially for me. That second game... Aiming just walked around the entire map, would press Q on Vayne once, auto attack, get a kill. The guy ended up getting 13 kills, but he was just feeding, feasting on the whole map, walking around, picking up kills. This was a complete 2-0 stomp in favor of KT. It's like when you go on a vacation, if it's the perspective of T1 and you're expecting, oh, hopefully we're going to get some nice weather. It's going to be great. You get there on the first day and you see just a little, just this little sliver of sunlight coming on through. It feels nice and warm. This is great. And then it's cloudy, cloudy, rain, thunderstorms all the way through is the way the rest of this game turned out for T1. KT putting forth that full effort, that full power, that full communication that we have seen develop for them over the course of this summer split and really vault themselves into that top tier, top category of the LCK. And yes, we're saying the top, given what they did against Gen G before and how they've managed to continue that momentum into this final bit of the LCK summer split. And obviously, you know, the saddest way to clinch a playoff berth was, you know, Hanwha Life 2-0's DRX, which booked T1's ticket, but Amidst a five-game losing streak, another 0-2 at the hands of KT. The saddest way to clinch. And now, detectives are out. Poby is starting for the challenger scene, which begins the speculation. Maybe that means that Faker's coming back this week, which would be insane for me for a couple of reasons. Number one, T1's already clinched playoffs. It's not like you need to go on a run in this last week. And number two... It was three days ago we were hearing that he's still dealing with numbness and can't use his right hand for things. It seems insane to me that three days later he's perfectly healthy and ready to go. There's, there's two sides pulling on this one. And the one is looking at the situation and, and you know understanding that everything that we have heard leading up to this, and especially, as you mentioned, the most recent uh, kind of update that we did get about his condition, I would not be moving forward with starting him or pushing to to make this return so soon type of situation and then on that other side the other side of the coin that you're looking at here is understanding and trusting someone like faker wouldn't put himself forth in this type of opportunity you still know of course he does have that desire yes put me in let me be the one that turns it around or you know i'm, I'm seeing what's going wrong i can be the one in there to fix it and figure it out you have to trust that he is in looking out for himself, that there has been this time. Maybe they're looking at it as the situation of we still have these games remaining. He is doing well enough in that recovery that we can afford to get him in and try and revamp it. Maybe things are so desperate and so bad with these other four members of T1 are so lost that you realize we got to turn this around even before playoffs by getting Faker into that lineup. So it really is a tough situation to get that read on. Because everybody should be looking out and wanting the best long term for someone like Faker. You know, the problem is, and this isn't just a Faker thing. We see this with athletes all the time. Especially, though, a guy like Faker who's so 
competitive, motivated, hates to see his teammates struggling. I worry that he maybe rushes back just because they need him so badly. I hope there's multiple people within the organization that are saying, Baker, think long term. Your health is number one, even if the team is struggling so mightily. Make sure you are at 100%. The other angle is maybe they legitimately think him playing one-handed is better than what not having him in the lineup right now. Oh my god, you know, there definitely would be a lot of people in that camp that might be voting for that one. No, nothing on Poby in that situation. It just is about how much of a difference Baker, someone like Baker can be for your team. Going to be a very uh, tight situation to keep a track of here in this final week of the LCK. And yeah, two games that they should probably be winning uh, for T1, but at this point, they're pretty much locked into that fifth seed. So seeding doesn't really matter. It's just about maybe getting some semblance of momentum heading into playoffs, some bit of confidence for the boys. Maybe Faker only plays this week to give them confidence and then steps away again. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes uh, for T1. We know what's going on in the comms for D+. When the clock strikes 30 minutes, and it must be chaos because it's another week of them matching up against the top team in Gen G, especially the second game in this series. You saw glimpses. You saw D plus getting aces, getting control of the game. And then you see this split call on contesting the Elder Drag or the Dragon Soul or pushing the base and the communication. Everything is just out of sorts. It's one of those ones where it's, it's so easy you know or it is at least at this point for d plus to develop and have that communication in the earlier parts of the game when things are still somewhat in flux and you get to these mid to late games and it goes out the window about what type of you know hierarchy there is for the information for the to control for the actual calls on what's going on and that's where it seems so disjunction for a team like d plus kia and it is so smooth for a team like gen g that does have that type of communication, that type of pipeline figured out on what they're gonna do. And that's where you see them lay down the hammer at the point in all these games. Positives, positives here for D plus that you are seeing in that competition. At the same time, you are taking away some losses and taking some pain in this one. And if you're a D plus Kia fan, you're very familiar with this type of pain and disappointment of seeing this team show those signs, show that competition only to stumble later in the game. The theme is the same for D+. They completely beat up on six, seven teams in the LCK and can't get over that hump to that top echelon against the top two or three squads in the LCK. The Gen G side of things, even before the KT series, but now especially after, it feels like this is the most criticized and disrespected 15 and one team that we've ever seen. And I think that partly comes obviously with whatever bad mojo cloud still hangs over the gen g organization to some degree about people buying in or believing to that ultra level of what especially when we get to this time of year and i think also referencing back to last year where they did also put together a record breaking split in the summer only to falter and not quite show us that full promise and level of talent on the world stage that's where i think some people are still being cautious still not buying into this one but i tell you what I have seen a different edge, a different hunger to this Gen G lineup compared to last year. Yes, things are different with A's there, but I think that brings you that little bit of an extra edge, a little bit of extra energy into that team environment and bottom lane. This Gen G team is certainly not getting the credit that it deserves. And I think a lot of that is also the, the Gen G mantra of not having the most exciting play style, even though guys like Chovy and Pays are some of the most exciting individual players to watch. The slower pace of the LCK plus Gen G makes for people to just uh, hit the snooze button. When's the LPL come on? So we can get even more team fighting. We're only a couple months removed from the LCS walkout. All the drama behind the scenes, the terrible end to the challenger scene. But now, as we get to the end of the summer split, not even one full split finished. It feels like we're in the golden era of the challenger scene. You got disguised DSG Toast Squad getting a reverse sweep in the winner's finals to book their ticket to the finals, which means they'll be on land. They'll be in Riot Studio and 
this team, you know, we still get all the reactions out of Toast. It seems like the LCS orgs, a lot of them stepping away, was the best thing that could have happened to having the most hype challenger scene we've had in years. It's incredible because it is such an awesome story, but it is also one of those ones that you reflect on and realize if things weren't as bad or as awful as they had been in the NA Academy scene, I don't think we get an opportunity like this for someone like Toast to step in, be energized, be focused, be committed to the scene and what is going on. And we have absolutely been reaping the rewards as fans for this, uh, for the team, for the scene and what has been going on. And I tell you what, also a fan, gotta be Toast because his squad getting that reverse sweep, picking up that extra sweep, add revenue time for the boys. You know, this is a content creator focus team when he's got that going on. Yeah, I mean, they, they're they straight up calling these teams the influencer teams, right? First influencer team to make the finals, which is, of course, a hilarious way to refer to it. But you got Meech getting a pentakill in this series. And I honestly feel like players are more likely to get promoted when they're not already under the umbrella of an organization like whatever, TL Academy, unlikely to get promoted. I know Jan and uh, Harry did so that's a bad example but you feel like coming from a squad like disguise it's more likely they get picked up for 2024 guys like me who have been really excelling in this challenger scene but as we head to these finals and you heard toast and scara kind of memeing it that people are actually going to show up for these finals i think there's no question you're going to have a way bigger fan base show up when a squad like disguise is in there number one if toast shows up himself at the venue but people just seem way more invested and can get behind and root for these new brands as opposed to evil geniuses academy yeah well, they don't carry that type of baggage as well and knowing you know some of these things and kind of the at least with someone like toast how honest and earnest it has started up you can have that type of faith as a fan when you're looking into this team really happy that we are in this situation that has played out all the way through this is a split that we have had that we end up here and we have this type of moment where we are going to get to get Toast and his squad on that LCS stage, the big time production, the big studio, bring everybody in. This is a type of moment to celebrate and have a good time. It's going to be the most hype Wednesday afternoon that you've ever seen at the LCS. <laughs> low bar even for the LCS to, to clear on that one but I'm sure we're gonna hurl it and get through this is absolutely some must watch LCS challenger action come on boys let's get into the scene let's get into this one for Tony and honestly you combine the viewership that he'll have for co-streaming it uh I feel like it's gonna be comparable to some of these LCS not even regular season playoff series because of that added fan base because it is a finals of course and because the lcs viewership has been so damn low for the last full year yeah and the other aspect that i think that is kind of not exactly been touched on or that i really do like about this and you know kind of goes to that point that you did mention a bit earlier about how you know kind of more likely to get picked up some of these players at times not being fully into that academy system where you are on an outside type of team like toast i think a lot of it is that pressure is that look of how, how, who who missed this guy who didn't pick him up in scouting type of thing how did you not grab this player now that he's doing that type of situation i think you get that little bit of an extra bump in that uh, in what you're advertising yourself as excited to see the future of the challenger scene which is something i haven't said again in multiple years so Kudos to Disguise and all these other squads out there. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with your beauties. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.